my vesicle brain. We already were starting from the bottom moving up. So we covered the uh, myelin cephalon, which is only the medulla oblongata. And we just started getting into the medullary cephalon, which is the pons and the cerebellum. <clears throat> we just started getting into the cerebellum. I think I'll put the cerebellum over here. Second largest structure of the brain. And this is why the anterior fiber tracts and the pons is horizontal because it's the same metencephalon, it's the same level. That's why those fibers are horizontal. Whereas the posterior fiber tracts that I put here in purple are the same axons of these ascending and descending tracts the same axons for the ascending and descending tracts in the spinal cord. So even though we're learning these things in sections, you gotta understand it, and you have a better chance of understanding it if you use things like colors. It's the same axons. <clears throat> okay, so the cerebellum functions as a commutator. Again, when I would write my outline and flow chart, I would include everything that is highlighted, underlined, or bolded. I'm not going to do it on the white board. That's your job. Everybody got it? I'm just going to give you little hints of using things like colors to connect things, like the fact that the RCC and the RRC look very similar. They are not the same thing. Respiratory control centers, which is the apneustic and pneumotaxic centers, are in the pons. The respiratory rhythmicity center, the RRC, is part as one of three vital reflex centers in the medulla oblongata. I'm telling you, if you just do this passively with words, these become the same to you. And Scantron questions are basically asking, do you know the difference? Well, if it's the same thing, you don't know the difference. Everybody got it? Okay. All right, so the uh, cerebellum functions as the commutator, which basically helps you to be more coordinated, smooths out motor impulses. To do that, it's not only got to send out motor functions, it's also got to get sensory feedback, and that sensory feedback is in the form of proprioception. Uh, I told you what proprioception is. You want me to tell you again? Yeah. It is giving your brain sensory information of where your body parts are in space without seeing them. You know where your body parts are even if you're not looking at them from proprioceptors. <clears throat> There's going to be three pairs of physical trunks of axons called the dunkles. So this is. So all the proprioceptors are gonna send information to the cerebellum. Three pairs of these trunks called cerebellar peduncles. Now be careful, cerebral peduncles are in the mesencephalon. Cerebellar peduncles and cerebral peduncles are different. You gotta keep that straight. Scantron questions are gonna ask if you know the difference. All right, let's look at those cerebellar peduncles. We have superior, 
middle, and inferior. So go ahead and fill that out. Okay, we've got the blanks. The inferior, I'm going to start at the bottom, the inferior cerebellar peduncles is where sensory input is going in, sensory feedback from proprioceptors. That's giving your brain information of where your body parts actually are in space. Middle cerebellar peduncles are actually getting input, and we'll talk about this later, from the frontal lobes, telling stuff along. Frontal lobes of the cerebral cortex. It's about planning, because that's where planning happens. That is about desired body position. Once the cerebellum processes those together, now it can send signals up to the primary motor cortex, which in lab we learned is the precentral gyrus of a planned motor response. Let's see. Let me just give an example. This, this might be difficult to understand all these bullets here. Or do you understand? Do I not have to give an example? All right, like I was talking about with golf, that is uh, an incredible frustrating Sport. If you take lessons, the teacher is going to tell you how to stand. He's going to explain it to you like I'm explaining how to do lecture exams. You have to put it together. So he's telling you you got to have your weight balanced on your feet. You want basically the head straight above the ball. You want your arms laying down almost straight vertical. Those are all things that are concepts. And your frontal lobes have to process that, of what this teacher is telling you. Same thing when I'm telling you how to succeed in classes like this, your frontal lobes have got to process it. If it doesn't, my words, I may as well be talking to a rock. Does this make a difference? So this is happening in the higher centers. That information is going in the middle cerebral peduncles into the cerebellum. All your tendon organs and your muscle spindles, that's sending information in the inferior cerebellar peduncles. Those are the proprioceptors. Because you gotta put it together where you are and where you're supposed to be. Inferior peduncles where you are. Middle cerebellar peduncles where you're supposed to be. And once you have that together, you might have a shot of actually hitting the golf ball. Because before you swing, that's input from the cerebellum, the commutator, is now going up to the precentral gyrus to initiate skeletal muscle contraction. Everybody got it? Does that example help at all? Yes. <laughs> Um, the cerebellum, it's uh, surprising because it's way down here in the lower brain from the original Robin cephalon. But it is so big, it is not surprising that there are actually higher functions in the cerebellum. It stores what is called non-declarative memory, which is things like, like, I used to play golf all the time. Got decent at it. And then I just realized, man, this is taking way too much time out of my life. I just quit. And then when I quit, I realized I didn't miss it. So why the hell am I going to spend one day a week doing something I don't even miss if I'm not doing it? 
But if I, my parents sometimes, twice a year, they want to go golfing. Okay, mom and dad. And I go out there and I, you know, I'll have you played in six months and I'll be halfway decent. And that's because the cerebellum stores those non-declarative memories. Lecture exams are declarative memories stored in the hippocampus. How to shoot a free throw, how to hit a golf ball, how to ride a bike, how to swim. Could have been years since you've done it. Those memories are stored in the cerebellum and plus some other areas in the brain. Everybody got it? How to ride a bike, how to hit a golf ball is a non-declarative memory that will not help you on lecture exam three. Everybody got it? Um, cerebellum has also been found to be where the pathology is for certain forms of autism and schizophrenia. So even though it's way down here, it is as the big second largest structure in the brain, not surprising, there is actually some higher functions in the cerebellum. All right, mesencephalon. <laughs> Okay, we have cerebral bellicles. different from the cerebellar peduncles. Cerebellar peduncles is all about processing proprioception. Cerebral peduncles are ascending and descending tracks. Which is basically the same axons. They are continuing up the brain stem. They're called ascending descending tracks in the myelencephalon. They're called posterior fiber tracks in the pons. They're called cerebral peduncles in the mesencephalon. They're all the same axons. That's why I use the same color. This is more on the anterior side of it. We're going to talk about the thalamus and the motor pathway here in a little bit as we get to the top part of the brain. There's just a side note here of substantia nigra. But it is highlighted. side layer. <clears throat> Basically, when we talk about the motor circuit, uh, the precentral gyro sends out way too many signals, and there's various parts of the motor circuit that are taking out unnecessary extra motor signals. Substantia nigra is one of them, and when you lose substantia nigra, uh, you have difficulty time doing anything fine-tuned or slow, because you just having too many 
signals coming out of the precentral gyrus and your muscles are to lack. something fine or slow, their head, hands or whatever is just going to start shaking. And when you cut open a uh, midbrain, the substantia nigra is gray to black. I mean, that's basically what the name means. Black shit. I mean, black stuff. Black substance. You also have the cerebral aqueduct. is the remnant of the hollow neural tube and the mesencephalon. I should have made another color for that. But this is a CSF. This is continuous with the central canal and the spinal cord below the myelencephalon. And here in the mesencephalon and myelencephalon is the fourth ventricle. of the hollow neural tube in the Robin cephalon, and the Robin cephalon was four to five. Split, become mentin and myelin. If this was Robin cephalon, the hollow neural tube, here's the fourth ventricle. Over here, it's the cerebral aqueduct. <clears throat> and then on the posterior side, we have the corporal quadrigemina. That we saw last week in lab. Two superior colliculi, two inferior colliculi. This is about visual reflexes. This is about auditory reflexes. I need to know for mesencephalon. There's a lot more to it. There's more to it in physiology. I'm limiting what you need to know for anatomy, lecture exam three. Any questions? This, by the way, I was saying in lab last week about how big the sheep corpora quadrigemina are compared to the rest of the brain. This picture here is a cat brain. And you just, you just hold it like this. Those are fingers and thumb holding this tiny little cat brain. He's got huge corporal quadrigemina relative to the rest of the brain. That's why cats can track a string or a ball or a bird or a lizard moving. It's all reflexes, no auditory and visual. All right, we're gonna skip and go all the way up to the talencephalon. Diencephalon up here. Talencephalon for our species becomes the biggest out of the five. Again, both diencephalon and talencephalon came from the prosencephalon. So this was this 
was pros and stuff on them. The only thing that stays the same is the mesencephalon. It was mesencephalon in the three low brain. Mesencephalon in the five vesicle brain. Mesencephalon in the brain in your head. It's the only one I didn't change. Everything else changed quite a bit. All right, the cerebrum, so there's two things in the telencephalon, and one is the cerebrum. Since it sits on top of the brain, on the surface, it is sometimes referred to as cerebral cortex. It's the same thing for our purposes. It's a center of higher thought, like processing how I'm telling you how to pass this class, or a golf pro telling you how to hit a golf ball. Those are higher processes. It is the final destination for sensory input, and it initiates the motor responses. So it's the beginning of motor and the end of sensory. You see what those second and third bullets are saying? It's the beginning of motor and the end of sensory. That's the cerebral cortex. And it also is doing a lot of processing of both the nervous system and the endocrine system. coordinating a lot of body functions. So just, I'm not, I'm not gonna have room for all, all that, just be sure your flow charts and outlines has everything highlighted, underlined, and bolded. Okay, <clears throat> the cerebral cortex again is the largest structure of the brain, cerebellum, the second largest, that has four lobes. Cerebellum also has two hemispheres. Okay, in the frontal lobe, you have the frontal association era, area. These are all lobes. This is where the higher thought processes are. Planning. Logic. Conscious control of your behavior. Like in ethics. That is frontal association area. That's in the most anterior part. And then the pre-central gyrus, we learned in lab, is the primary motor cortex.
primary motor cortex, the primary motor area, precentral gyrus. So this ties to the third bullet. Initiates voluntary motor responses. Initiates somatic motor. That's the third bullet. And that's the primary motor area. That initiates voluntary motor commands, the skeletal muscle. This is hardwired here. If you have a stroke or any kind of damage to this area, you're going to have some motor defect. In the parietal lobe, you have the primary sensory area. This is the second bullet on the previous slide. Final reception interpretation of sensory impulses. That's the primary sensory area, the postcentral gyrus. conscious of that. If you were touched on one side of your body, it's going to show up and eventually end up in the postcentral gyrus on the other side. Somatic, that's why it says general conscious sensory input, primary somatic sensory. This is why the central sulcus is called the central sulcus, because this is somatic motor. This is somatic sensory, and the central sulcus is running down the center of the somatic area in the brain. Remember that from last week? There it is. Somatic motor, somatic sensory, central sulcus is running down the center of the somatic area of the brain. Everybody see that? Just behind that, it, wait, let's talk about the premotor area. That's also in the uh, frontal lobe. Motor area. This is where that golf lesson is being processed. It's technically part of the frontal association area. <clears throat> now you have damage here. And it's amazing, in fact, if you have damage in a lot of places in the brain, it's amazing how much your brain can accommodate for it. That damage is sometimes referred to as soft wire. That's an older term. The newer term you might hear in your future careers is neuroplasticity. There's a lot of things your brain can adjust for, even though there is a patch of the brain that is dead and no longer can function. It's amazing how much the brain can accommodate for and the premotor area is one of them. <clears throat> and then in the back in the parietal lobe is the somatic association area. And that is interpreting sensory, conscious, or somatic input. Can I give you an example? Yeah. Right here, if I'm feeling this, it's registering on the post-central gyrus on this side. Everybody got it? Hey, Lynn. Same place if this happens. But the somatic association area is interpreting that completely differently. Everybody get what that, how to interpret somatic inputs? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not doing it again. <laughs> All right, and then in the occipital lobe,
Simple love is all about vision. So you have the primary visual area that's way in the back in yellow. The back's potentials end up there, and your brain is going to generate an illusion of an image. I just above it is the uh, visual association area. Uh, vision is a completely complex sense. Uh, I just say it vis interprets visual input, it's way more complicated. You have simple cortical neurons, you have complex cortical neurons, you have hyper-complex cortical neurons. Some neurons are generating an image of the outside edges of things. Some neurons are giving you textures of things. Some neurons are only about angles and lighting. And then I haven't even started talking about motion. It is a completely complex sense, vision, but it's all in the occipital lobe. <clears throat> Temporal lobe is all about hearing. Okay, on the bottom two diamonds are language centers. They are found only on the left side, left cerebral hemisphere. How do we know this? From when people have pathology in those areas. You have pathology in the inferior frontal lobe on the left side, which is also, by the way, I'll just tell you right now, you look on any website or any textbook on functional brain areas that textbook or website will show the left cerebral hemisphere, like this one. And the reason why is that's the only side that has the language areas. On the inferior frontal lobe, right here in blue, you have a stroke there and you have problems mouthing, speaking words. You have control of your mouth, you can eat, you can roll your tongue, you can do everything on command, but you cannot speak. That's called Broca's aphasia. So this is called motor control of speech. Left side only, inferior, frontal lobe.
Now, if we look at these association areas, visual association areas right around in here. Everybody see that? Somatosensory, somatic association areas, kind of like right here. The auditory association areas right here. And if you see where those three association areas come together, on the left side, you have Wernicke's area. That's in red. Are you seeing that on the picture? This is where language is both understood from the outside world as well as where you need to put things together to be understood yourself to the outside world. You have damage in this area, depending on how extensive it is, it's devastating. For example, if you have Broca's aphasia, the, uh, you can still eat, you can still roll your tongue on commands, but if you try to talk, that's it. But I will text you, or I'll write you a note, or write me a note, and I can understand what you're writing, and I can make myself understood by what I'm gonna write. Everybody understand Broca's aphasia? Mm -hmm. Wernicke's aphasia, again, depending on how extensive it is, not only can you not understand other people, you can say words. You can actually speak words. You just cannot string the words together in an understandable sentence. It's nonsense. That's Wernicke's aphasia. Everybody got it? Mm -hmm. Much more devastating, yes? So with Wernicke's, would you be able to hear? Nope. Oh, well, you can. But again, your words won't make any sense. But just think about this, okay? Look at these blue areas in Wernicke's area. Look at the words on that slide. That's occipitals, the visual association area. Are you hearing the words coming out of my mouth? That's temporal association area. And if you were blind, you could be taught how to read Braille and on all these room number signs, look at the numbers and underneath there are a series of dots. That's for blind students. That's Braille, somatic touch. That's somatic association area. And on the left side, where all the three of those associations come together, because those are the three modalities of language, that's Wernicke's area. Does that make sense now? Okay. All right. Talon Cephalon has the cerebral cortex, and then deep to it, the basal nuclei. The old name that you'll still hear is basal ganglia. But remember, ganglia is a term for gray matter in the PNS, but it was used for so many centuries, it, the name is still there. Great islands of gray matter in the CNS is nuclei. It really should be called basal nuclei, but basal ganglia is an old name that's still there. <coughs> These have several functions.
Okay, on this slide it says that the caudate nucleus is the only one doing it. Actually, it's all these guys that are doing this. Okay. And I set it up like a flow chart. You put the putamen and the globus pallidus together, that's the lentiform nucleus. You add that the caudate nucleus, which is a ring around the thalamus, and then you take the brain in that area of the deeper telencephalon and you do a coronal section through the brain, and you see these gray stripes. Okay, it's gray matter, but it's in stripes, and so anatomists have called that the striate cortex. Striate for stripes. Everybody got it? So all of these nuclei, that, that's what they are, nuclei, form the striped cortex. The colostrum is a little bit more lateral. It's not really part of the motor circuit. Basically what I've done here with colors, everybody look at this. If it's red, it's part of the motor circuit. very complex, and I gave you some of the complexity here with the cerebellum, where for the cerebellar peduncles, this is coming from proprioceptors, this is coming from the frontal association area, where you're planning to hit the ball, the golf ball. You've got to process the information from the golf pro. That is happening in the frontal association area. That's coming into the cerebellar peduncles via the middle, middle cerebellar peduncles. Once it has processed all that, now it's going to send out a signal. This is how you're going to hit the golf ball to the primary motor cortex. But the primary motor cortex is completely uncoordinated, sending out way too many action potentials, and many of them are unnecessary. And you know what? If you want to see an example of this, look at a neonatal infant, less than six months of age, that is a body that's working on three pluses, which is why they can't do anything. Can't even grab the keys. Well, by six months, they should be able to start to be able to. But even grab for the keys, they're just, they have too many pluses. And what's going on in the motor circuit is various things are doing what it's saying here in the Ducati nucleus, even though all of them are doing it, is it's taking out unnecessary motor action potentials because too many come out of here. This is taking it out. There's some places in the midbrain that are taking it out. And these are the things, the pathways that are developing in the first year of life. And by the time the kid is one year, they should be about ready to start walking. It might take them another year of life to be able to run with any kind of coordination without falling. Those are all maturations of the motor circuit. Everybody got it? But this sends out too many, and so you gotta have other things that are taking out unnecessary signals. Does the red help? Yes. All right, now we're dying stuff. I did do that over there. This is still called forebrain because it's from the prosencephalon. deeper forebrain. <clears throat> Thalamus. 
football shaped thing. You got one on the left, one on the right. This is the major relay station. You saw that last week with the three sequential neurons for sensory. Thalamus is the reason why your existence as a human being makes sense, since your entire existence is a brain-generated illusion. The thalamus is what's organizing the illusion. So sight is sight, and sound is sound, and touch is touch. Everybody got it? Because all the sensory information, except for the sense of smell, it's either going to go here for the sense of hearing. It's either going to go here for the sense of touch. It's also going to go here for the sense of taste. It's going to go here for the sense of sight. All of those signals are directed by the thalamus. The only sense that it does not direct is the sense of smell, olfactory. Okay? There are some motor impulses that relay here, but they're a minority. The vast majority just bypasses the thalamus. And that's why I say, especially for sensory. Yeah, there's a few that do it for motor. So it's not only sensory, but it's mostly sensory. You see how it's football shaped? Huh? You see how you have two of them? One on the left, one on the right. Everybody see that? Yes. What's in between the two footballs? The lab last week. Mm -hmm. Interthalamic adhesion? The third ventricle. That's what's in between. Remember the duck head? Yes. Remember the eye for the duck head? The eye for the duck head was formed by this. The thalamic adhesion. Remember that? In between the two footballs is the third ventricle. I'm not going to erase this, but this should have been an orange. Hypothalamus. So this is actually a statement about telencephalon and diencephalon. But the fourth bullet is mostly done by the hypothalamus. Okay? So if you want, uh, if you want a summary of these four bullets, are you guys ready? Are you guys ready? Yes. Or will you should I just leave it? Just leave it? No. This is the first bullet, frontal association area. That's higher thought processes. Postcentral gyrus, primary somatic sensory area. That's the second bullet. Primary motor cortex, precentral gyrus. That's the third bullet. Hypothalamus is mostly, not all, but mostly the fourth bullet. all from the forebrain, frozen cephalon. Okay. We will uh, talk 
here in a bit about how the hypothalamus controls the pituitary gland. Um, but we'll hold that till later. I get this feeling like you guys are maxing out. Any questions? Can I give you an example how this is a blurred distinction between nervous system and endocrine system? Mm -hmm. Hypothalamus is part of the brain, diencephalon, yet a ton of hormones come out of it. Everybody see the blurred distinction? Also part of the diencephalon is another blurred distinction, the pineal gland or pineal body. It is part of the diencephalon, part of the brain, and a hormone melatonin comes out of it. body is actually controlled by the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland is actually controlled by the hypothalamus. You see how key this is, the hypothalamus? It's even controlling the pineal gland. This hormone, melatonin, tends to come out in hour and a half cycles of peaks and valleys. Goes up, goes down. And if you time it between each peak, it's about an hour and a half. Melatonin goes up, goes down. Goes up, goes down. Can anybody give me an example of an expression of this rhythm? It's called circadian rhythm. Up and down every hour and a half. What's that? REM cycle is one expression of a circadian rhythm, which is why REM cycles tend to run about an hour. Okay, this is why you guys want to learn science. Because I know melatonin does this. Have you guys seen bottles of pills with melatonin to help you sleep? Okay, let's just think about how the digestive system works. Melatonin is a protein hormone. Protein is a chain. And the individual links are amino acids. Did you guys know this? You should. When you take that pill, proteins are too big to cross over into your body. You guys, I told you the donut analogy. Mm -hmm. It's uh, proteins, unless they're broken down into amino acids, will stay in the donut hole. The only thing small enough to go into the dough are the links, amino acids. So you want to take melatonin, you want to spend money think it's going to help you sleep, your body does not see melatonin. It sees all the links after your dig digestive system has broken down that protein into individual links of amino acids. Your body can't tell the difference between that expensive pill or tofu or steak or double-double animal style. Your body doesn't know the difference. You really think that pill helps you sleep? It does. From what? Placebo effect. That's one expensive placebo effect. Oh, there you are. I thought I recognized you students. Okay, there's two integrated systems. I have green only for the RCC and RRC, I'm going to use it again. All right. Limbic system is going to include
integrated means it's involving multiple vesicles here. And the limbic system is going to include diencephalon, some medial telencephalon, including some basal ganglia. So it's, those three regions are going to come together. And it says they're underlying telencephalon and diencephalon. This is sometimes referred to as the primitive brain because it's, on, it's just basically pleasure paying base type things. You know, I'm hungry, I'm sleepy, I'm horny. You know, basic, you just wanna go take care of it. Not a lot of higher thought, okay? Uh, if you look at the gray matter that involves the limbic system, they form like rings. Can you see those kind of round structures there? Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets its name. Limbus means ring. So it includes some basal ganglia, includes some um, diencephalon, thalamus, hypothalamus, as well as the medial, mostly temporal lobe. So I should, I should put this. Not just the temp medial temporal lobe, but most of it is medial temporal lobe. But it includes some frontal lobe, some parietal lobe, but mostly medial temporal lobe. Um, the other one was mentioned well, last week, and that was the reticular formation. You guys remember that from last week? Again, the reticular formation is the gray matter itself, but it looks like it functions as Particular activating system. You got to look at the gauge PowerPoint, but it involves four of the five lobes. In particular, so those are the two integrating systems: particular formation I covered last week and the limbic system. Okay, for future healthcare workers, let me give you just a little bit of practical education about the limbic system. Pleasure and pain, primitive brain. Everybody got it? If you guys have the perseverance to finish this difficult journey, well, number one, I will tell you what, you'll be in a very select crowd. The vast majority of students drop out. Only a few have the moxie to stick with it to the end. When you have done that which is difficult and finished, you will never struggle with self-esteem again. Because you know what you did was tough. Challenge hit you, ain't no problem. I've had challenges in my life, ain't no problem. I've done tough, I've been through tough, I can do it. You guys understand that? For all the people that I've known in healthcare, the vast majority are fine ethical people. You want to make sure your ethics comes from the frontal association area because you plan to do no harm. You plan to be fair. You plan to own up to mistakes and not cover them up. You plan to be ethical. Everybody got it? Mm -hmm. You make sure your ethics does not come from this. Because I did know a few people that I could tell their ethics came from the limbic system. Where they just want reward and want to avoid pain. There's things about how they conduct themselves in the business you could just tell Dude, your ethics are coming from the limbic system. And our limbic systems are a little more advanced than a lizard's. So maybe have your ethics come up from a little higher source. Everybody got it? All right, let's talk about meninges. 
I want to try to get up to CSF here. That's fun. Okay, though well, we did cover meninges in the spinal cord, and there are some differences. Most of the differences is with dura matter. For example, in the spinal cord, there's only one layer of dura matter in the spinal cord. In the brain, it's two layers. <clears throat> one is stuck to the um, inside periosteum of the cranium, that's the endosteal layer. And then underneath that, close to the brain, is the meningeal layer. There's a few places where the two layers separate. And where they separate, there is a large vein known as a dural sinus. Now these dural sinuses have specific names. You don't have to know them for lecture exam three. But wherever the two layers of dural matter separate, there is a large vein called a dural sinus. Okay, one of the potentially large essays for lecture exam three is the CSF tracing, which is why I tried to put some of this up there. CSF tracing. CSF comes from blood and it ends in blood. And where it ends in blood is the dural sinuses. <clears throat> now for the dura matter in the brain, we do have some specific sheets of dura matter that lie in deep fissures. We had this one in lab, false cerebri, it lies in the longitudinal fissure. The other one that is not in lab, but you need it for lecture exam three, is the temptorium cerebelli. It lies in the transverse fissure, separating the cerebrum from cerebellum. This one is horizontal. So false cerebri is vertical, tentorium cerebelli is horizontal. That's why you can see it coming in at almost a 90 degree angle. specific sheets of dura matter in deep fissures. First one in the longitudinal fissure, second one in the transverse fissure. <clears throat> Key to that is the arachnoid, and again underneath the arachnoid is the cerebral spinal fluid. So that the entire CNS is in a water bag of CSF for protection. circle where it says arachnoid granulations or arachnoid villi. Draw an arrow out to the side and write CSF drains. Arachnoid villi are the CSF drains that allow cerebral spinal fluid to go back in the blood. That's what it says, allows CSF to circulate back into the venous circulation via dural sinuses. There's little fingers of arachnoid that extend into the dural sinus and they act as CSF drains. And the CSF goes back in the blood through them. That's relevant for the essay. So they drain into the sinus, but then there's something else coming into the sinus that they actually leave from that? Like the fingers go into the sinus? The dural sinus is just a vein. So but there'll be a series of cerebral veins ending into the internal jugular vein. Internal jugular vein becomes the brachiocephalic vein, which becomes the superior vena cava, and you're back in the heart. So, so if you're in the dural sinus, you're in the circulatory system. You're in a vein. Oh. So it's draining out in blood. Right, and the essay starts with blood and ends in blood. 
And this is how it ends. The CSF drains through arachnoid villi into dural sinuses. Boom, you're back in the blood. Everybody got it? And here it is right here. Here's arachnoid, here's the little fingers called arachnoid villi, or granulations. Here's the dural sinus. So in black is the dura matter, and see where the two layers separate is a large vein. Right here, where the arrow is, is blood. CSF goes through the subarachnoid space, through the arachnoid villi, into blood. Arachnoid villi are the CSF drains where CSF goes back into blood. Do I need to say that again? Yes. This is the subarachnoid space here. This is all CSF. It's going to go through the arachnoid villi, which is the CSF drains, and it goes back into the dural sinus, which is a vein with blood. That's how the tracing ends. That's the end point of the tracing. Can everybody see that in the picture? Mm -hmm. Can you envision the end of the tracing? Yeah. Okay. The pia matter is actually attached to the surface of the brain. Now when we saw it on the sheep brain, you can see that layer that you could peel off. What you didn't see is that layer was loaded with capillaries. And in a living brain, when you expose pia matter, the brain looks like beet red because it's covered in blood from the pia matter. Underlying highly vascular. <clears throat> All right, on the picture on the right, there's an error. Let's see if you can find it. This is dura matter. That's correct. This is arachnoid. That's correct. See this one little thing right here? In real life, it looks like a little spider web. And there's a whole bunch of those little extensions of arachnoid, which is why they call that second layer arachnoid. See, look at all these spider webs. Ah, uh, arachnoid. Everybody got it? This is the subarachnoid space, but CSF is in here. Where's the error? just eliminated what is not an error. What's that W-W-M? White matter. Okay, and then that PM is PM matter? Peter matter. Okay, so this is attached to okay. So if there's no PM matter on that? It's really easy. So it's, it's a, it's a it's an easy, obvious mistake. When I saw it, I couldn't believe it. So I just kept it in there and I said, oh, let's see if my students can find it. Apparently not. Is the white matter not white matter? Because it's, we can see dark matter? Pyramidal cell bodies? <clears throat> What's under the PM matter and the gray? Gray, gray matter. Gray matters on the outside. That's why you see cell bodies there. In the spinal cord, gray <coughs> matters inside, white matters outside. In the brain, it switches. Gray matters on the outside, white matters on the inside. What's right next to PM matter is GM, not WM. That's why you see cell bodies there. Can you believe it was that obvious? And they published it on the internet? <laughs> okay, 
I think I'm going to have you fill in the blanks here and we'll leave it on here. I'm gonna just have you write something on the slide and then we'll go over it. We'll start with this on Thursday, but fill in the blanks. And I need whiteboard for this and I'm out. So in the CSF, cerebral spinal fluid is cushioning the central nervous system. Your brain is actually floating in CSF, so like just imagine putting a bathroom scale on the bottom of a four foot swimming pool, you'll weigh a whole lot less. So does your brain. Because of the blood brain barrier, you need a circulatory adjunct. That third diamond is because of the blood brain barrier. Then, on the bottom of this slide, write, not the essay. This is partial. You do that tracing and you're not gonna get all the points. This is not the essay. That is only partial. Yes, he's actually the speaker. All four ventricles have choroid plexus. You remember that from lab? That is where the capillaries are, where CSF comes from blood. So put down your pencils, we're gonna cover this on Thursday. So you have the most choroid plexus in the lateral ventricles. That's where you start the tracing. CSF comes from the core and plexus in the lateral ventricles. It goes to the inner ventricular foramen to the third ventricle, where more core and plexus adds more CSF. It goes down the cerebral aqueduct to the fourth ventricle, where there is more core and plexus to add even more CSF. From the fourth ventricle, you get a three-way fork in the road. You can either go down the central canal of the spinal cord, you can go through the two meet lateral apertures and the one median aperture, and go into the subarachnoid space. This three-way fork in the road thus is central canal of the spinal cord, sub subarachnoid space down around the spinal cord, or subarachnoid space around the brain. Regardless of which three forks you go through, you will end up in that last fork because in the subarachnoid space around the brain is the only place you have CSF drains, the arachnoid villi. It's going to go out there, act like the light to the dural sinus. That's the whole world. Okay. We'll cover that in detail on Thursday.